uh, is saying he's going to make sure you'll show up to your future hearings, then yeah, that's fine. So there are people who are ineligible for bonds. Thank you. Um, it's exciting to be here. I love Utah State. And this is a beautiful building that you have. Uh, this building did not exist when I was here, as maybe it didn't even exist when, uh, when some of you guys started here. Um, and uh, the Ag Science Building was in a different place, and it was much older, and sometimes the power went out because too many people were using plugs at the same time, and it would knock the power out for the entire Ag Science Building. It was over by the TSC. Um, so campus has changed a lot, but still love being here. Yesterday afternoon, I was able to speak with a group of uh, pre-law students, or people thinking about going to law school. In the Family Life Building, we came out. It was about 5.30, 5.45 and the quad was beautiful, and the weather was beautiful, and I just thought, wow, this is a great place and an awesome place that you guys get to go to school. Um, so you got a little bit of introduction for, uh, to me there. I am in um, Mesa, Arizona. Our, we have an office in Mesa. We have an office in Phoenix. I'm in a firm with um, four other lawyers, but I am the only one in our firm that does immigration law. And so um, I'm excited to talk about immigration law and policy. Um, Surprisingly, uh, or not surprisingly, what you see on the news is not always reality. And I'm not talking about one particular news source. I'm talking about people uh, who are good journalists trying to get it right and still don't. And so sometimes I watch, um, I'll watch something on uh, the news and, and they're talking about immigration and it's wrong. And I think, wow, if, they got, if, if this person who really worked their best to get this right got it wrong, it makes me think, what are the other things I don't know about <laughs> that they're reporting on? And because I don't know about that uh, particular thing, I, I just assume they're right. So um, yesterday in the group I was with, I said, well, who knows what DACA is, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, what does that mean? Got some different responses. Um, and it was just illustrative for me to see that there's even on something that I think is, you know, it's been around now for seven years and pretty uh, widely talked about. Even there, there was a lot of misunderstanding on what exactly that means. So hopefully today, with the readings that you've done, for those of you who are in the class, um, we'll put some of that into context uh, and hopefully give a better idea of how this all works. So I'm going to start with just... U.S. government and uh, civics basics. And this is what you should have learned in like ninth or 10th grade. But we're going to go over it and then talk about how it relates to immigration. So first thing, right, the government structure. We've got the three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. Um, and we all know this, and we, we at least we've learned it at some point. Um, but on the news a lot, we see who? We see the ex executive. Uh, especially in the current administration. I don't feel like we hear a lot about what's going on as far as proposed laws. We hear a lot about um, congressional committees looking into things and investigating things, which is one of their powers. But the, the biggest uh, authority that Congress has, of course, is to pass laws. So Congress passed the Immigration Nationality Act in 1965, and then there's been uh, changes and, and new iterations of that since. The most recent significant changes were in 2001, and even more significant changes were in 1997. But really, since 2001, we have not had significant changes from Congress. Now, in a second, we're going to talk about rulemaking and promulgating rules that agencies do as given that authority by Congress. And there's lots of new rules since 1997. But uh, new law as passed by Congress, there's not a lot. But the big one was in 2001, 2002 which was um, a result of 9-11. Of so we're going to talk about that. OK, so first, the legislative branch. So all legislative power in the government is vested in the Congress, meaning that it is the only part of the government that can make new laws or change existing laws. However, very important when we talk about immigration law, the executive branch with the full force of law, but these are only under the authority of the laws that are passed by Congress. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, passes new rules. It puts out new rules. And in the law, we, talk, we say they promulgate new rules. And they have to publish those new rule proposals in the National Register. So the new rules are published in the National Register and go through a process of notice and comment. This is mandated by the Administrative Procedures Act. So there's lots of government agencies. 
Um, and the legislative branch created all of them. But once they're created, they then govern themselves under the executive branch, right? So we're going to talk about the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but I want to show you this graphic. This is uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, and this is everything that the Affordable Care Act touches. So the Secretary of Health and Human Services is in the President's cabinet, but they work with all these other groups. The actual Affordable Care Act itself was over a thousand pages, but the rules promulgated, or the, um, the, the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFRs that accompany the Amer Affordable Care Act, are now, now that we've had it for a few years, now over uh, almost 12,000 pages. So we got a big law, and then we had, then people went and they had to implement what Congress had put in that law. And we're going to talk about that in the immigration context. But the exec executive branch, what's their job? Their job is to run the government. Um, they're, you know, the executive branch is in charge of everything. That's, they're there to execute what has been put in place by Congress and to run the government. Um, and, uh, and so the Administrative Procedures, Procedures Act is very important in the context of all agency law and especially um, in the context of immigration law because it governs when the courts can get involved. All right, so the judicial branch. The judicial branch, of course, interprets the law. The Supreme Court is the highest law of the land. Does everybody have a right to appeal to the Supreme Court? No. The last uh, right of appeal are the Fed. Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is going to be here on campus at Utah State having oral argument. I suggest you all go, make it happen, because that's a really big deal to have them here. Um, but the, the circuit courts are the one in a civil matter, and I otherwise meet the requirements to do so in federal court, and I lose at federal district court, then I have the right of appeal to go to federal to the Circuit Court of Appeals. But then, from there to the Supreme Court, there's no right of appeal. Well, what does right of appeal mean? It means that they have to take your case. So then, I'm, I live in Arizona. If this was my situation, I would go to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit, if they deny me, I, don't, I can appeal to the Supreme Court. I can ask them to grant certiorari. And uh, if the Supreme Court grants cert, then my case gets heard. But most likely, they're not going to. The Supreme Court takes between 100 cases a year, depending on the year. And they do it a lot of times when there's a circuit split. So it's when the Tenth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit and the Sixth Circuit all have come to a different conclusion on the same uh, matter or same issue. Um, and then lots of constitutional questions, important constitutional questions, the Supreme Court will take up. But the Supreme Court's uh, role now is to, to shape law. Nevertheless, it does seem that every, about every term ends up two immigration cases before the Supreme Court. And that's because immigration has a great tendency to split the circuits. And so when you end up with a circuit split, that's when the Supreme Court gets interested in granting cert to solve the circuit split and say, once and for all, this is the law of the land. OK. Um, just other interesting thing. Uh, how do you get to the Supreme Court? You, you either have a constitutional question that you're taking from your state Supreme Court. So that's Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent. That's a case from Arizona. Started in Arizona in the in he lost in Maricopa County Court. He took it to the um, state Supreme Court. When he lost to the state Supreme Court, went to the United States Supreme Court. And because it was a constitutional question, because the court was interested in it, they took it. And then we got Miranda rights, because that's how it started. If it's not a constitutional question, then it has to be a legislative interpret, uh, an interpretation of legislation question. So if you want me question, don't have a decision on the constitutionality of a particular, particular statute unless they have to. So a lot of times what we end up with is a case in front of the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court is interpreting the, um, whether or not the agency has acted within its authority from Congress and has properly promulgated a rule or made a decision in a particular instance according to the, the uh, statute that was passed by Congress that gave them the authority to do whatever it is they're doing. And um, so the only way you get that in immigration is if you've lost with the immigration court, which we're going to talk about in a second. You've gone to the Board of Immigration Appeals, 
and you've lost with them, all of that was in the executive branch. So even though we're calling it an immigration judge, and even we're calling it the Board of Immigration Appeals, those are actually just government employees that are doing their best to make a decision on the law, but they are not a, they're, they're not an actual judge, a, a third um, Article Three judicial branch judge. So if I get a final agency decision, and this is for any agency law, I get a final agency decision, that's when I can go to the Circuit Court of Appeals. So if, if somebody loses their deportation case and they appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals, and they lose that, and if they're in Arizona, they're now going to go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And they're going to have to convince the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that not only was the judge wrong, not only did they abuse their discretion, but that the thing that they were wrong about is something that is, um, that, that, that question at hand is uh, something that could go either way. There, there's the law passed by Congress doesn't specify enough. Uh, the Ninth Circuit first has to find, okay, we had a question of law here where there was, you know, people could disagree. Um, and so that's the first step. And then if they get past that, then they decide, okay, this statute of passed by Congress that was, uh, you know, not completely clear and then was interpreted by the agency did the agency interpret it in an impermissible way? And then and only then do you win with the circuit. And so um, most, for most uh, people that are in deportation proceedings, their, their best chance is going to be with the Board of Immigration Appeals. And if they lose there, most of the time, th I mean, they have the right to appeal. Again, they have the right, but the, the chances of the circuit court even taking jurisdiction of that issue is, is pretty small. So I've had cases, they go to the Board of Immigration Appeals, they lose, they file for a petition for review in front of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Office of Immigration Litigation, which is under the, uh, the Department of Justice, files a motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And then I have to reply to that within 10 days saying, no, the court really does have jurisdiction under the Administrative Procedures Act and under the case of Chevron, which is called Chevron Deference, it's a Supreme Court case. And you really do have to hear this case, Ninth Circuit. And if we get over that hurdle, that in itself is a pretty big victory. Um, I'm actually going to look at my case and decide whether, what, uh, what they're going to do. OK, so next, the presidential cabinet. We're not going to talk a lot about this, but there's four positions that are really integral to what I do in my job. The attorney general, why? Because the attorney general is the head of the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice is over the Executive Office for Immigration Review, which is the immigration court. The Secretary of Homeland Security. Well, Homeland Security is over Depart um, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Border Patrol, and USCIS, which is uh, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. And then the Department of State, anybody who's doing something uh, internationally, if they're wanting to, it, it, you know, let's say you go on a study abroad and you meet a great girl or a guy and you want to marry them and you get engaged, well, that fiance visa is first going to be processed by USCIS, but then you're going to go through a process of a, D a Department of State 260 with the consulate or embassy in that foreign country. So the State Department comes into play. And then finally, Health and Human Services. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Health and Human Services, Office of Refugee Re um, Resettlement, is since 2002, when Congress stirred up everything with immigration, since 2002 has been over unaccompanied um, minors. So children are showing up at the border uh, under 18 years old, without a parent, without a guardian. Um, that's where Health and Human Service gets involved in the immigration context. Okay, so Homeland Security. Homeland Security, the three is over seven agencies, including FEMA, um, but the three that I deal with, USCIS, which is if I want to apply for, if I'm a permanent resident, I'm going to apply for citizenship, I'm going to send that application to USCIS. If I uh, want to petition my you know, my minor child, let's say I've naturalized in the United States through some legal way, and I've got a minor child in another country, I can petition for them, file an I-130, I'm going to file that with USCIS. Immigration Customs Enforcement. This is the law enforcement arm of immigration within the interior of the United States. Because who, of course, is the law enforcement arm of immigration at the, at the border, which includes every port of entry, which includes lots of airports that are 
in the interior, right? Salt Lake has border patrol. Denver International Airport has border patrol. Any international airport has to have border patrol there. They have to have um, that because they're going to go through customs and, uh, and a border patrol agent is going to be in charge of that. But of course, the, the huge mass of border patrol agents are at the southern border. The northern border with Canada also has uh, border patrol agents, but it's nothing like the southern border. Um, the Attorney General, so I gave you a little bit of an idea here. The Executive Office for Immigration Review, which, uh, um, which is the immigration courts. So when I say I'm going to court, what I mean is that I'm going to see an administrative law judge at the Executive Office for Immigration Review and present my client's case. I'm not going to where there's a jury. Um, they do record everything. Uh, those, all those hearings are recorded um, audio, but there's no court if, um, It's an administrative court. And uh, yeah, um, and, and, and at the end of the day, that administrative law judge is, an, is a government employee who represents that agency. So the Immigration Nationality Act get, it created this, and this agency, the Executive Office for Immigration Review, is under the Department of Justice, and they are tasked with running things. Very important. Who read the article uh, that was sent out about Jeff Sessions? Like five, six, OK. So Jeff Sessions was the Attorney General. As the Attorney General, under the authority given him by Congress, he made a lot of what he did is he referred Board of Immigration Appeals to himself, cases from the Board of Immigration Appeals, some that had been settled law for over a decade. And he came in and said, I'm going to change that. Which, like it or not, that is his, that is his prerogative under the Immigration Nationality Act. There's so many places in the INA where it says, at the discretion of the Attorney General. At the discretion of the Attorney General. At the, so anytime Congress does that, there is, I mean, it, it, it's so hard for the Ninth Circuit or any circuit to come in and then say, oh, well, there was an ambiguous statute and the agency did it wrong, when in so many places it says, at the discretion of the Attorney General. However, there are a lot of things where the circuits have ruled on an issue, and that is then the law, and the circuit court's decision is superior to the Attorney General. And so there's been a lot of issues where Jeff Sessions, that's with that article, came in, changed law in a really uh, hurried manner, and it ran afoul of standing circuit law. So then immediately, groups started suing the attorney general in, in federal court to say, what you did by changing this BIA decision, that's fine. Your prerogative is BIA. However, all these circuit courts have ruled on this issue in this way. And unfortunately for you, balanced government, your your uh, prerogative at this point. The circuit has already ruled on that issue. But then you have another problem. Because sometimes the circuit didn't rule on whether or not this is how it always had to be. The circuit ruled on the rule as the, a final administrative decision from the agency. And so they just kind of were looking at that final administrative decision in a vacuum. And so then the agency comes out, uh, through and has a different final administrative decision from a Board of Immigration Appeals judge. And it does have to be readdressed. So it's, uh, part of, this is part of why immigration law is ever changing and very complicated and sometimes not that fun. Um, but but uh, it's also, that's also part of what makes it fun. So Health and Human Services. Then under the health, just like I showed you with DHS, there's all these agencies under DHS. Under Health and Human Services is the Office of Refugee Re uh, Resettlement. And under ORR, is, uh, they're tasked with taking care of all, all the people who are, all the um, unaccompanied uh, children who arrive at the border. And this happened also because we got March 1st, 20, 2003 was when it was passed. Um, but it's the. Homeland Security Act of 2002. Prior to that, we had the Immigration National, uh, uh, the INS, Immigration Naturalization Service, and they were everything. They were USCIS and ICE, and um, and you had Border Patrol, but it was it was very different. And then we had 9/11, and everything changed. And the Department of Homeland Security didn't even exist prior to the uh, to 9/11. So it was created a whole new government agency. Now it's huge. Border Patrol alone has a budget of $50 billion a year. Um, 
and that's uh, that's about double the entire GDP. Of, so just to put that in context, I brought up the State Department a little bit. This picture here is the U.S. Embassy in London. Um, I've seen the U.S. Embassies. Um, I haven't seen the one in Mexico City, but I've seen the I've seen some consulates in Mexico. I've seen the embassy in Guatemala. I've seen the embassy in El Salvador. They look nothing like this. This is a statement building. We are the United States. This is our London presence. But it's a you know it's a beautiful building. But um, consulates uh, and embassies, foreign consulates and embassies are doing visa processing. So if somebody comes to Utah State on an F1 student visa, they would have had an interview at a foreign embassy or consulate prior to receiving that visa. If somebody comes here to be a professor at Utah State on an H1B visa, they would have an interview at a foreign consulate or embassy. Um, one of my clients right now that is bringing, um, we're working on bringing a bunch of teachers under the J-1 visa to teach in Arizona public schools for three years. They will go through an interview at the foreign consulate or embassy. So that's where the State Department gets involved. And so I do deal with them um, in, in, you know, on a weekly basis, um, but that's not as much as what you see in the news. All right, so all of that, I don't know how I did on time here. Um, I was hoping to get through all that in 15 minutes, and I took about 20, so not too bad. So that's hopefully to just give you some, some context. So I know we went through all those slides, uh, and now you can't see those slides. So just, okay, we've got the president, right? We've got his cabinet, like 15, 16 positions under him. One of them is DHS. One of them is DOJ. Uh, one of them is HHS, Health and Human Services. One of them is uh, Secretary of State. That's uh, Mike Pompeo right now. So State Department. Okay. Then under DHS, the three that I again, there's seven agencies, but the ones I deal with are Border Patrol, ICE, and uh, USCIS. And then under the Department of Justice, I deal with. The Executive Office for Immigration Review, which is the Immigration Courts. And then when I go to the Ninth Circuit, the attorneys I'm facing of immigration um, litigation. And they are representing the Board of Immigration, they're representing DHS in front of the circuit court. Um, so the Office of Immigration Litigation, those are all that's also under the Department of Justice, but it's very separate from the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Um, and then this is uh, unaccompanied children. That's probably very legible. And uh, then State Department, for me, that is foreign embassies um, and consulates. So this is a little bit of the framework that I'm working within. Um, Right now, and I also want you to remember the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, which requires notice and comment rulemaking when an agency wants to implement new rules. Okay, and uh, I may write something else up here, I don't know, but that's, that's a little bit of a review. So this is the EOI Detention Center. It's a, uh, there's lots of, um, private prisons in Arizona. So that's a corporation. You can go buy stock in them. Um, their stock went up considerably when President Trump won uh, election. Um, there's three main groups. There's Core Civic, CCA, and GEO Group. And these are private prisons that are located throughout the United States that uh, have contracts with the Department of Homeland Security, with ICE, to house immigration detainees. So let's talk about who is detained. And for right now, we're just going to be talking about adults. So um, if I'm in the United States and I'm a lawful permanent resident and I've been here for 20 years as a lawful permanent resident and I work and I have a driver's license and I own my home and I have, everything's good. Um, and then I make the decision to sell some drugs and I get convicted of drug trafficking. I am going to first face my criminal penalty and then ICE is going to be waiting for me whenever I finish. And then ICE is going to detain me. And even though I'm a lawful permanent resident, and even though I've been in the United States for 20 years, and even though blah, 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 and I've done my time, right? We talk about, oh, he's done his time. We've, we've paid our debt to society. 
So I've done my time, guess what? I am done as a permanent resident if I was a drug trafficker. There is no, we're gonna talk about in a minute, cancellation of removal. Um, there is no cancellation of removal for permanent residents if you've committed an aggravated felony and certain drug, national security, terrorist related things. So drug trafficking is one of those. Okay, how about drug use? So if I get stopped and I've got less than 30 grams of marijuana, and I'm just talking marijuana, it's very specific to marijuana, less than 30 grams of marijuana, it doesn't matter if I'm California, and it's legal, it's federally illegal. So if I'm a permanent resident and I live in California, if they come to my office and say, can I smoke pot, I would say absolutely not. Why? Because there are people getting stopped in California or detained by ICE that are permanent residents and are being put into removal proceedings. Because if you have more than 30 grams of marijuana, you have committed a removable offense and you will go to a detention center. And we're going to talk a, a more about cancellation of removal in a minute. But I am now uh, committed a removable offense. If I had less than 30 grams of marijuana, or if my conviction document does not state in the factual basis of my plea agreement what amount of marijuana I had, then that is not a removable offense. And if I'm a permanent resident, they cannot put me in removal proceedings. So we talk about deportation. That's what everybody hears, deportation, deportation. Under the law, it's actually referred to as removal proceedings. So you're still going to hear about people being deported. But under the law, they've probably actually been removed. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Um, so those people that are permanent residents get deported, do they have the chance so that if a, like a single member household could maybe settle them? Yes, that's a great question. So um, the United States has the most favorable or one of the most favorable property rights laws in the entire world. Until recently, unless you were a Mexican citizen, you could not buy property in Mexico. Uh, now there's a process you have to go through, including temporary living, temporarily living there. At present, somebody who's never set foot in the United States can hire somebody to represent their interests and purchase land or businesses. Or in one case, the Chinese investors bought the uh, Chicago Stock Exchange. And that's who owns the Chicago Stock Exchange now, not anybody in Chicago. So we allow that. That's, that's, on, that's free market. At, you know, when you go all the way back to the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, and at Yale and at Harvard, it, they taught um, very much free market everything, uh, laissez-faire, let things be, let the economy do itself. That still exists. So anybody who's got an interest in the United States, in a car, in land, and whatever, they can still maintain that interest even if they're deported. They won't be here to live in that house. They can hire a real estate agent from wherever they go, and that person can sell their house and can send them the proceeds. And those things happen. Um, but that person is going to be detained. And I thought you were going to ask, well, what can they do? You know, what, what rights does this person have? Well, in a lot of situations, even if that person is put in removal proceedings and they're a permanent resident or a non-permanent resident, depending on what their situation is, they're going to have a right to seek a bond, and uh, a bond from the immigration judge. Um, and so right here in this facility that you can see, there are four courtrooms. There are four immigration law judges there. Um, and uh, a lot of what I do when I go to this place is ask for bond. So to get out on bond, you've got to have a lawful permanent resident or US citizen sponsor. And the closer they are to you, the better. So if it's your wife or your husband, that's going to be the best case scenario, next best or a parent who's a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. And then from there, it really depends on the judge. Um, I know there's a judge in uh, Georgia, at the, or no, not in Georgia, in Miami at the Chrome Detention Center, who if you don't have one of those people, he's not giving you a bond, period. Doesn't matter if you were stopped for traffic. You're not getting a bond. Um, a lot of people appeal him his decisions to the Board of Immigration Appeals, and he routinely gets overturned. However, because of his position, and he's been there, and he's been put in this position as an, as an administrative law judge. He's not getting fired. He's not getting put on probation. He just keeps getting overturned by the BIA. For some judges, that's really embarrassing. Because what does that say? You got the law wrong. But he doesn't care, because he won't take the time to appeal, and they'll just self-deport, 
and then, then they're gone. So he's good with that. Um, but he gets turned over by the BIA a lot because he has that basis of you have to have one of those people. There are other judges who it could be a pastor from your mom's church. So your mom's in the United States with undocumented, and she goes to a church in Phoenix, and that and you're here now in a detention center, and uh, there's judges in Eloy that said, okay, yeah, if your pastor's willing to write his name and sign it and come to your bond hearing and, and uh, is saying he's going to make sure you'll show up to your future hearings, then yeah, that's fine. So there are people who are ineligible for bonds statutorily. And this is a really big distinction. So when I come to the United States to seek asylum um, and I cross illegally, I will be found on my notice to appear in immigration court. It will say I am an alien present without parole. If I presented at a port of entry to seek asylum and I was not granted release on my own recognizance. So this is going to be pretty much any male who's arriving by the border seeking asylum by himself will not be released. He will be put in detention. Um, I will be found to be an arriving alien. Believe it or not, these people who showed up at the port of entry are statutorily ineligible for bond. So they have to do their whole asylum case, maybe six, not seven, eight months in a detention center. These people who jumped the fence or crossed the river and were found 50 yards inside the United States are statutorily eligible for bond and are routinely granted bond. So what are people more likely to do? Now, do I think this is a smart policy? No. I think the people who show up at the port of entry ought to be those who are going to be more likely to be granted bond. And if you jump the fence, then less likely to be granted bond. But not all our laws make sense. Um, so uh, there are people who are also ineligible for bond because of their criminal history, like that LPR who got convicted of drug, uh, of, of drug traffic, trafficking and again, his, uh, I should have said this earlier, his criminal conviction may not say drug trafficking, but his criminal conviction may say three pounds of meth, and that's plenty that now when he's in front of the immigration judge, he's going to be charged with drug trafficking under, his, uh, under the category of removability. So if the criminal conviction is enough to say, yep, this guy did X, uh, and, and there's a factual basis to that conviction that shows how much, then ICE, when they bring the notice to appear and charge this person with being removable from the United States, they're going to say, oh yeah, he's a drug trafficker. They're going to charge him with drug trafficking under the INA, and he's not going to be allowed bond, and he's not going to be able to seek cancellation of removal. Yeah? So obviously what you are presenting to the Commissioner for LP is changes in policy and law. Yeah. So arriving aliens have been ineligible for bonds since 1997. And aliens present without parole. So the issue here is aliens present without parole is anybody who's here without status. Um, so if I have lived in the United States for 20 years and I get pulled over uh, by the, by the um, Utah Highway Patrol and I'm charged with something and I end up with an immigration detainer and immigration comes and detains me, my notice to appear is going to say alien present without parole. And at present, somebody who uh, get, gets barely inside of the United States but did not present at a port of entry is also going to be classified on that notice to appear as an, as an alien present without parole. And that makes them statutorily different. And that statutorily, that statutory difference is, is something that was passed by Congress. That wasn't an agency. So if it was an agency promulgated rule, my guess is that the, actu the current administration would have already changed it. Um, but as, and they did try to, they, they, they promulgated a rule like a month and a half ago that anybody who came to the United States seeking asylum was, would be ineligible for bond, but it was immediately challenged. And right now there's a federal injunction in joining the government from um, putting that into place. Because it, basically the, the litigation that was filed in federal district court said this, this is directly contradictory to what the Immigration Nationality Act says. 
So like I said, Jeff Sessions, even though he did stuff that I didn't like as attorney general as, as pertaining to immigration law, uh, most of what he did, he had, he had the statutory authority to do under the Immigration Nationality Act. There's a lot of stuff going on with asylum right now that the current administration is trying to do to stem the flow, right? And I agree, we can't have 140,000 people come to our southern border every month this year. And it's slowed down, mostly due to the summer. And, and you know, that's my belief. Uh, that's my political opinion. We can't have 140,000 people every month. So the, the administration is trying to do something to stem the flow. Most of what they're doing, however, is lawfully questionable under the Immigration Nationality Act and under existing uh, circuit law, which is pretty specific on how asylum seekers have to be dealt with. And uh, there's nothing illegal about seeking asylum. Um, you, anybody can come to the United States and seek asylum. And that's not just US law, that's international law that we're bound to as well for international treaties that we've had in place, some of them for over 50 years. Um, so ineligible for bond, you might be ineligible because you're an arriving alien, and you might be ineligible because you have a prior deportation. Any, even if I'm living in the United States for 15 years, but I was deported back in 2001, and then I came back illegally, that's going to make me ineligible for bond. So I'm not going to be able to get a bond statutorily. Now, there are people that are statutorily eligible, but the, the judge will deny because it is the, it is, in, in removal proceedings, you're called the respondent. You're not the defendant. You're the respondent. Because again, this is not criminal court. This is a civil procedure. And because it's civil procedure, they are not afforded an attorney by the US government. In a civil case, the state or the federal government has to give you an attorney. Immigration is not that way. Why? Because it's civil court. Now, we often say as immigration lawyers, the consequences are just as dire, if not more so, than most criminal cases. However, it's a civil procedure. And it's not a criminal procedure, so you don't, get a, you don't get an attorney provided for you. So there are a lot of cases where the attorney goes in and asks for bond, and the judge is going to deny, because the attorney or the person for their own representing themselves, pro se, has to convince the court that they're not a danger or a flight risk. And so a lot of times, we can't get over danger. If somebody's committed, a, you know, has been charged with domestic violence, the, because of evidence rules in immigration court, again, it's an administrative law court, they can look at whatever they want. So ICE will bring the police report. We can ask the judge to keep it out. But the judge doesn't ever keep it out. The judge says, no, I can look at the police report. This is not a criminal proceeding. Uh, the rules of evidence, the federal rules of evidence, only loosely guide immigration court procedure. So in almost every case, the judge is going to look at whatever ICE brings them. So ICE brings them a police report. And even the police report is completely wrong. And believe me, guys, I have seen some terrible police reports that are completely wrong. Um, the, the worst case scenario, the, the best example that I can give you of that in my own experience was where we actually had a video that a family member took on their cell phone of a woman at a lake who had taken, she was taking some pills for depression. Their family went out to a lake on a Saturday. She mixed that with alcohol. It didn't react well. And she was trying to walk into the lake without a life jacket. And this particular woman did not know how to swim. She was there with extended family members, including her husband. Her two brothers physically tried to keep her out of the water. And in the video, one of her brothers slaps her, thinking this is going to make her come to. Her husband was arrested and charged with domestic violence. Her husband, in the police report, is the person slapping her. Her husband, in the police report, had no reason to be doing this. There was no explanation of what was going on. We submitted to the, the immigration judge um, the video, which she didn't want to take at first. And then I, made, I put it in the file. I made a motion. And I found some case law from the Ninth Circuit basically saying, you need to consider this evidence. And so then she kind of begrudgingly looked at the video. Um, and this is all more work than she's normally used to, right? And, and, and they've got thousands of cases. And so I don't, I'm not judging this judge for not wanting to do it. But I was saying, hey, this is a different case. This is not your everyday case. Please look at the actual things. She denied the bond. And I appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals. When she saw the video, I, I, we had a, her, my client sitting in her courtroom. She knew what my client looked like. She saw the video of the brother slapping his wife. She still said, doesn't matter. I'm basing this decision that he's a danger off the police report. The police report can be wrong, guys. I, uh, I don't know if you've had family members or friends or yourselves have had issues with police enforcement. I'm, I'm not an anti-police guy. Um, I absolutely think we need law and order. I go to the 
Phoenix uh, Police Prayer Breakfast every June, and our firm donates money to that cause. I'm not anti-police, but I can tell you the police get it wrong. And so in this case, uh, she was denied bond, not because she was statutorily ineligible, but because the judge found him to be a danger, and so denied based on danger. I appealed to the BIA, which made her put her oral decision into everything off the police report. The BIA, unfortunately, did not overturn that decision, and the man got tired of being in a detention center and waiting, and he just uh, asked for his deportation at his next master calendar hearing. So that happened. Um, fortunately, that's not the norm. Uh, a lot of times, I read the police report, and I talk to my client, and the police report is right. And they did do whatever it says they did, and they are going to have a really hard time getting bond. Um, any questions on that before I move on to child and family detention? Yeah? So um, with those that are granted bond, how often, like, I don't know if you know, like what percentage or how often do they show up for those hearings for most, most of the time? OK, so very good question. The, um, the people that are granted bond and that started out in a detention center and are granted bond by a judge show up to their hearings over 95% of the time. The statistic goes down if they are ordered removed. So if they go to their final hearing, they have a trial, and they're ordered removed, the percentage of those people who actually show up, they're issued a call-in letter. Um, and that means, OK, you're going to forfeit your bond if you don't show up to court on this day at this time. And, uh, or not at the court, at the, at the ICE office. Um, and it tells them, you know, you're, you need to show up for removal, purpose of visit, removal from the United States. Um, but usually, the ICE is not waiting to arrest them at the deportation hearing. Um, usually, they'll get a call-in letter. They'll wait and see if you appeal. And then if you don't appeal, and the 30 days for appeal goes by, they send a call-in letter to the bond obligor. So when a bond is granted, the person who pays the bond is the bond obligor. And that person receives the call-in letter saying, if the person you paid this bond for doesn't show up on this date at this time, we're keeping your money. Cool thing about immigration bonds is that it would be a great place to invest your money. Because the government right now gives 8% annual interest on your, on your immigration bond. So if you, go, if you get detained and you pay a $10,000 bond, and your court case goes on for three years, and you win, and now you get to go get that bond. You say, I was granted cancellation of removal, or I was granted asylum, or whatever it might be. And then they issue that money to the bond obligor with that 8% interest for those three years. So you, you know, you can make a little money. Um, I don't think that's what most people are thinking when they hear they have to pay a $10,000 bond, right? But uh, even, if, even if you don't win your case and you're ordered removed, as long as you show up, you get that money back. Um, if people that are ordered removed at a final hearing and then don't show up for after they've received that call-in letter, that's when the bond is revoked. And, and then it's almost impossible to get it back. There are circumstances where we have been able to get it back, where there are extenuating circumstances or hospitalization. Or... OK, so child and family detention. This is something that I'm sure you've heard about a lot in the news. And maybe not so much lately. I feel like the buzz has kind of decreased. But it was a lot in the news. I, I mean, going back a year. Um, so first and foremost, I just want to get, and again, my goal is not to convince you of any particular political p stance or opinion. I'm just trying to give you the landscape. So um, family detention existed under the Obama administration. The Dilly, Texas Detention Center is a family detention center that existed under the Obama administration. And families were kept in detention. And the only reason more families weren't kept in detention is they did not have more family detention centers. So the Obama administration was never anti-family detention, never. They put as many families in family detention as they could with the space they had. The issue that a lot of people, and, and there were a lot of immigration advocates that were very mad about that and trying to stop it and fighting, you know, filing things in court and suing Jay Johnson, who was the former Department of Homeland Security um, secretary under the, the President Obama's administration. So that's, that's not a new thing. What changed is the scale at which is happening and the conditions at those family detention centers. And so that changed a lot. And the main, the main change was the current administration made a decision to greatly decrease the number of family units that were granted um, uh, 
that were allowed uh, to be released under their own recognizance. So under the previous administration, because of that space limit, most people that were arriving, this is a parent, a single parent with a child. Now sometimes mom and dad would come together and the child would, and with their two minor children or their three minor children, their one minor child, and they would all be released together. But most cases, even under the prior administration, dad was detained in a detention center like this one here and mom was released OR with the child. Um, and that's what, how it worked. Uh, and that continues to happen now. The big difference now is they have uh, created a lot of temporary facilities to do family detention. And then the most controversial, perhaps, is that um, now these family uni units are being, given, are, not, are being subject to the Remain in Mexico policy which is we're not even going to bring you into the United States. We're going to give you a notice to appear at the border and tell you to come back on such and such a date for your first master calendar hearing. And you're going to get to ask for asylum. What they're not allowed to do under international agreements is they can't tell a Mexi uh, Mexican national to wait in Mexico for their asylum. So if I'm a Mexican national and I show up, they have to let me into the United States. They may detain me, but I get to come in and ask for asylum here. Um, so. Child and family detention, I have not personally been to a family detention center. My law clerk that worked for me last summer was there for two weeks um, uh, this last spring, or two summers ago. She was there for, uh, she's at BYU Law. She was there for two summers, and I talked to her a lot about it, and I've talked to other uh, immigration attorneys in Phoenix who have also been there. Um, their takeaway from the family detention centers is, uh, okay, you saw on Fox News these really great pictures that have been really clean and kids playing on the grass with a soccer ball. And then you saw on CNN these people covered with uh, metallic aluminum blankets and sleeping on the ground and way too many people inside of uh, uh, bar, um, chain link fence. And I said, okay, so Dilly, Texas, where they were, they said it's somewhere in between those two. It's not as, it's not nice and beautiful and kids playing soccer on the grass. And it's also not everybody in uh, you know, chain link fences sleeping on the ground shoulder to shoulder. Those things did happen, though. And those situations really exist where that's happening. Border Patrol is supposed to make some sort of decision with, of where somebody's going within 24 hours, whether it's an adult, a child, a family unit. Within 24 hours, there's supposed to be a decision that they're going to go somewhere else. They're, if it's a child, they're supposed to, within 72 hours, either have found, made a decision on what's going to happen, and if they haven't, then a, chi an, a, an, a minor child who's not with a parent has to be turned over to the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And then ORR puts that child in, in a shelter anywhere in the United States. So I've had clients that have been sent to New York, to Chicago, to DC, to Miami, to Georgia, and we have uh, lots of Texas, and we have um, uh, unaccompanied minor children detained or housed um, in uh, shelters in Arizona as well. And so that's really what you're seeing was that, and it was probably the worst in April and May, was this huge influx, and Border Patrol was, I mean, I'm not trying to forgive them, and I'm also not trying to say that these people are evil, even though some of them probably have lost their humanity because of what they post on Facebook. It seems pretty clear that they've, they've lost their humanity. But a lot of them, I think, this was just a complete lack of resources. You, it, people show up in May, and Border Patrol has to house them. They detain them, and they have to put them somewhere. Some people were not getting out. There was no decisions being made in 24 hours. There were a lot of decisions not being made for 72 hours. And I did meet people in the Eloy Detention Center, which is where you see right here, that were in those situations for two to three weeks. So you say, well, that's contrary to law. The law dictates that Border Patrol has to make a decision and move them. So Border Patrol is not supposed to keep people in custody long term. The ideal is 24 hours, you're, out, you're in and out of Border Patrol custody. Whether you're released OR, if you have a prior deportation and you are a Mexican national, Border Patrol can just take you back across the border and drop you off. And, and that's done all the time. If you are from Central America and you have a prior deportation order, they will reinstitute the prior deportation order and put you in a, in a, but then they still, because there's not flights that go to Central America every day, um, 
they are from each place, then they'll put you in a temporary ICE facility. But they do transfer your custody over to ICE. So what happened in April and May, and again, I'm not forgiving them, but I also want there to be some context. There was just way too many people showing up at the border and no place to put them. And so that's what you saw on the news. And that did happen. And there were people in chain link fences, shoulder to shoulder, laying on the ground, and not being given an opportunity to go to the bathroom and this, that, and the other. That really happened because there were so many people. Um, so Border Patrol has taken great trying to prepare so that, that doesn't happen again. Like I said, over the summer, uh, illegal crossings go down. And they are, but depending on what happens, they're likely to go back up. The governments of Guatemala and El Salvador are working pretty hard right now with the US government uh, and, and are interested in stemming that flow. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. OK. Anybody want to leave right now? You can leave. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Um... Oh, boy. Thank you. So um, asylum, there's affirmative, defensive, and, and then how it works with the family units and the company minors changes a little bit. So affirmative asylum is uh, my client right now just got the news on Monday that she won her asylum case. She came on a B1, B2 tourist visa from Venezuela, landed in Las Vegas, was admitted as a temporary visitor, and within a month applied for asylum with the USCIS. Her, her asylum was granted, and in one year she'll be able to apply for permanent residency. So that you only get to ask for affirmative asylum if you're already in the United States under some other way. However, Probably, probably got to go back 10 years, but 10 years ago, Border Patrol often uh, paroled people in the United States and let them ask for affirmative asylum with USCIS if at the port of entry they were convinced that this person had a legitimate asylum claim. Border Patrol is no longer allowed to do that under agency regulations. They have to put somebody, they have to give a notice to appear, they have to put them in immigration removal proceedings. So now if I show up at the border and I say, I've got this really great, great asylum case, and let's, what's a slam dunk asylum? A slam dunk asylum is, OK, I am from and I, um, and I, ha I worked on this case in law school. I'm from Afghanistan. When I was 13, I was forced to marry my first cousin, who was 36 years old. And in her words, he raped me multiple times a week because it was never consensual. And so she came to the she came to the United States and on a on a temporary student visa. And as soon as she got here, she applied for asylum. And she was granted asylum for being a member of a particular social group and for having the political opinion that you shouldn't have to marry your cousin. Um, and so she was she was granted asylum. That was a strong case. Um, another really strong case. Uh, if I'm from um, and Venezuela is right now a great a great. Uh, example. If I'm from Venezuela and I was a member of the Voluntad Popular um, political group, the political party, and I was an active member and I was a leader in that group and I suffered some sort of harm uh, and I have, there's a nexus, there's a belief that there's a connection, the harm based on my uh, actions of being a leader of the opposition um, to Maduro, that's going to be a really strong ca uh, asylum case. Yes. There can you can win asylum based on a well-founded fear of future persecution, but it's much harder to prove. If you've act, if you've suffered actual persecution prior to departure from your country of origin, there's a much better chance. But in political uh, cases, especially if somebody was a member of a political party that was overthrown, they don't need to actually have suffered uh, that harm. They're going to be able to establish that well-founded fear of future persecution, but it's much stronger. So an example, I have a. Um, did a, did a Venezuelan case. Guy lives in Caracas. He's a member of Voluntad Popular. He's also a, le a business leader. He has a couple businesses. Um, he lives on a street where, uh, you know, he, he lives on a street where there's no side yard. He has a little bit of a backyard and then his neighbor right behind him, but there's no side yard. All the house is touched and there's no front yard. It's just your front door and then the sidewalk. And um, he had been, 
actively in opposition to uh, Maduro, the Maduro regime and had recently appeared, this was about a year ago, had recently appeared uh, next to um, one of the leaders of the opposition uh, with Juan Guaido. So he is at his house, it's 9 p.m., and uh, rocks come through his window, followed by tear gas. He immediately opens his front door, thinking, I've got to get out of here. And he lives alone with his three dogs. Um, and he's, he's like, I got it. So he goes out the front door. On this end of his street is a tank from the, um, the, National, Gal the National Guard. And same on this end. So he has no escape, and there are men with machine guns. And he went back inside his house and covered his eyes and tried to stay low to the, as low to the ground as possible so he could breathe, and they left. And because he was, had the, the blessing of being wealthy and having previously traveled to the United States on pleasure you know, for, for vacation to go to Disneyland and different things, he had his B1, B2 visa. And uh, the next day, he walked out of Venezuela because there was no way to leave Venezuela otherwise. He crossed the international bridge between Venezuela and Colombia, booked a flight in Colombia, and flew to Miami. And he, his case is still pending, but he has a really good chance of winning because he can prove I was politically involved. So there's also religious-based asylum, national origin. Um, uh, so there's race religion, national origin, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. A lot of my cases are membership in a particular social group. So in the aldeas of Guatemala, which are small mountain villages, um, women are not legally on the books considered property, but women generally do not have rights. And that's not because the national government of Guatemala says they don't have rights. It's because the national government of Guatemala has no control over these small aldeas. That's too far, it's remote, it's hard to police. In most of these small aldeas, there is zero police presence. And so because of that, men control everything. And there is nothing in some of these places a woman can do when, if she's in a domestic violence situation. So the Board of Immigration Appeals in 2011 found that an indigenous Guatemalan woman unable to, relie to leave a relationship constituted a uh, legally cognizable particular social group. And up until, I don't know if you, for those of you who read the article on Jeff Sessions, up until Jeff Sessions became the attorney general, somebody who could prove all those facts could win asylum based on their membership in that particular social group. Look, I live in Guatemala. I live in this small aldea. I'm indigenous. I only speak this one language that they only, you know, maybe there's five or 10,000 people on the planet that speak that language. I have no help or protection from my national government. They're unwilling or unable to protect me. And that person was granted asylum. Jeff Sessions came and said, nope, I don't like it. So he got rid of that. He referred that 2011 BIA decision to himself and changed it. So now that's the precedential decision. And right now there is no, there's no, there's basically Jeff Sessions with that and another decision got rid of any sort of domestic violence or marriage-based particular social groups. It just doesn't exist right now. So that's being fought in the, in the uh, circuit courts. And we don't know how it's going to come out. But for right now, that's how it is. So that's why I was saying that that's, again, to a certain extent, that's his prerogative, right? We talked about the Immigration and Nationality Act gives him at the discretion of the Attorney General, at the discretion of the Attorney General, at the discretion of the Attorney General. But to a certain extent, there was also all uh, circuit law that had based their decisions off of that decision. So what now happens with that circuit law? The agency said, oh, we're changing that basically changing that rule. It was a, it was a decision from the court, but change, it was an administrative court. So we're changing that rule, and here's a different rule. So the, the circuit law that existed was based on a prior rule that doesn't exist anymore. So now it kind of has to be rehashed in the circuits. Yeah? Yeah, so depending on what it is, for political opinion, oftentimes they have registered with a political party, and they have proof of that. They have proof of how long they were there. They have pictures of them wearing, uh, my Venezuelan clients of the opposition, they were yellow t-shirts at a march with their friends, you know, with a sign, banner. And at the time they took that, that was not preparing for an asylum case. That was, hey, we're, we're part of this movement, and we're, you know, we're going to overthrow this dictatorship. 
And uh, we're going to get, uh, you know, with the hope, uh, which now seems ill-placed, that they were going to have an actual election where it wasn't rigged. And so this is, they, you know, they, a lot of times with political opinion, there's pretty good evidence. Um, it, I've done only two religious-based asylum cases, and both of those were for Indian Sikhs. Um, so a Sikh living in India right now is not a very good place for them. Um, it's really hard to openly practice their religion depending on what part of India they're in. And so uh, that was pretty easy because we were able to prove that they were Sikhs since birth, that their parents were Sikhs, that their brother and their sister and their, you know. Um, and so there again, it was, it was uh, easy to prove. I know colleagues that have done um, Christian converts in China, and that becomes a lot more difficult because ICE, depending on who the ICE prosecutor is that, that you get the day you go to your hearing, uh, is going to be more or less critical depending on their, their world experience and their personal opinions. Um, and so if you go in and you have an ICE prosecutor that kind of says, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, guess what? You're probably going to win your Christian-based asylum. I was in China. I was persecuted based on my Christianity. And if you get a prosecutor that really drills into it, they're going to ask questions like, uh, well, isn't it true? And this is how prosecutors get to answer questions. They get to answer direct questions. Um, you don't get to ask direct questions when, when it's your client on the stand. You have to, say, you have to ask open-ended questions. But then on cross-exam, the, the prosecutor will get up and say, Mr. So-and-so, isn't it true that you'd only been a uh, member uh, of the church for two months when this happened? And isn't it true that you weren't actually physically hurt? And now you've just given testimony that only this person you know of in your town was, uh, was threatened, and, and not even he, you know, so they're going to drill down, drill down, because that particular prosecutor, you know, so that's a case where, depending on the judge, and depending on the prosecutor, your outcome could be completely different. And sometimes the evidence is pretty slim. Well, I have this baptismal certificate. Well, how easy was it to, how easy would it be to manufacture a baptismal certificate? And sometimes, what if I don't even have the original and I just have a copy of the baptismal certificate and I'm claiming that I was uh, uh, persecuted on the basis of my religion when I wasn't raised or born in that religion. I've only been in this religion for three months before this event that I'm telling you happened, happened, but I don't have a scar and I don't have a broken bone and I don't have a picture and I don't have a police report. And then it's credibility. So the wor worst thing that can happen for me in, a, in an asylum case is where the judge makes an adverse finding of credibility. Because when I go to the Board of Immigration Appeals, if the judge found my client credible, at the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals has to take his testimony as fact. So then I get to make my argument that these things are fact. Not that they may or may not be true, and then I have to say that the judge erred in his or her decision denying my client asylum based on facts in evidence. If the judge makes on the record an adverse credibility finding, I don't get to argue that to the BIA. So sometimes in asylum, there's not a lot of evidence and, and if they testify credibly or not. Now, the judge will have to articulate why they believe that person did not testify credibly. It can't just be like, oh, this is a far-fetched story. I can't believe this would happen. I had that, a judge said, well, I think if this was happening, I would hear about it in the news. She said that on the record. So that's where she messed up, because if she had kept that thought to herself, I might not have won on appeal. But we did win on appeal, and we got it sent back to the judge, and then I got it moved to a different judge at that same location. Because she said on the record, I don't think that, I, I just can't believe this, because if this was happening, if this was really happening in Mexico, then I would have seen it on the news. And... Unfortunately, there are lots and lots of bad things happening in Mexico that we do not see on the news. In 2018, Mexico had the second most murders in the world behind who? Syria. And what's going on in Syria? A war. Okay, so now that's not per capita, that's total murders. So Mexico has some problems, guys, right? And so the judge was saying, oh, I don't believe this because I haven't seen it in the news. Well, you know, because her worldview didn't support what we were presenting, we were able, she denied, but then we were able to get it reopened. Um, unaccompanied minors get to ask for asylum with USCIS first. And USCIS is a non-adversarial uh, procedure. So USCIS, if you're an unaccompanied minor, you get issued a notice to appear, but then they administratively halt your deportation proceedings while you get to go ask for asylum with USCIS. And that's going to be a much, and there's rules about um, minor asylum that are more, it's a less adversarial, you have to consider other factors, um, and that, yeah. Okay, so cancellation of removal, I'm just gonna hit on this really quick. 
I talked about it a little bit earlier. If I'm a permanent resident, I need to have been a permanent resident for at least five years, and it needs to be, have been seven years since I was admitted in some status. So if I came to Utah State on an F1 student visa at least seven years ago, and then I got married to a great USU student that we became draggies together, and, uh, I then, uh, and I became a permanent resident at least five years ago, and now I'm charged with a removable offense. So there are offenses, like less than 30 grams of marijuana, that if I'm a permanent resident, they can't even place me in the removal proceedings. But if I had 32 grams of marijuana, which is a very unlikely plea deal, that the plea deal would say 32 grams of marijuana, but let's just pretend. Then I am removable. ICE will issue me a notice to appear. I will go to the detention center. I will have to fight for 42A cancellation of removal. If I win, that's my only chance. If I screw up again, I'm never getting another chance. This is a waiver of my removal. I get one chance for cancellation of removal as a permanent resident, and then I can better wait five years and have perfect behavior and become a citizen, because if I ever mess up again any removable offense, I no longer have 42A cancellation of removal open to me. Then there's cancellation of removal for non-permanent residents. These individuals must have been in the United States at least 10 years. They must have a qualifying relative, which is a US citizen or permanent resident, parent, spouse, or minor child. And I must prove to the judge that that parent, spouse, or minor child is going to suffer extreme and unusual hardship if I am removed from the United States. That's the part that makes it almost impossible. Extreme and unusual. Certainly it's easy to prove, and at least in my opinion, that every family will suffer extreme hardship if dad or mom is deported. It becomes much more difficult to prove extreme and unusual, because unusual requires that they would suffer harms not common to other individuals similarly situated, which of course means you have to prove something beyond the harm that a normal family suffers when dad or mom is deported. And that's where it becomes very hard. Still winnable. I've done them. I've won them. But it's very, very hard. And I don't know why I got permanent residence back down there again, but sorry. I did some, something with copy and paste. Uh, but 10 years, qualifying relative, extremely unusual hardship, and no disqualifying crimes. If I have a DUI, I can still ask for cancellation of removal. Um, if I drug traffic, no chance. If I committed an aggravated felony, no chance. Aggravated felony for immigration, that could be a theft that is in, exceeds $10,000. So if, the, I, if I am involved in a crime where the, so even if I didn't take $10,000 cash, if I um, was running a chop shop uh, where I was getting cars and taking the parts out of them and, and doing that or something, and the value is considered over $10,000, that's an aggravated felony. I cannot ask for cancellation of removal. So that's a lot of people that have been in the United States that do something. Now, unfortunately, uh, in, in the previous administration, they said, hey, we've got 11 and a half, 12 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, something around that. About half of those, by the way, are people that entered the country with status and then simply overstayed their visa when it expired. Um, but we, we don't have the resources to deport everybody, so we're going to do it in a very matter of fact, a very programmatic way. And so there were three levels of, of people. And uh, if you weren't on that list, then ICE released you OR without putting you in removal proceedings. So here's an example. Uh, prior to the current administration, my client, who has since been ordered removed, and we're appealing her, her removal order right now at the Board of Immigration Appeals, uh, she was driving on the highway in Tucson. She was pulled over by a highway patrol officer for going four miles over the speed limit. He ultimately did not give her a ticket. However, he was quick to phone ahead to Border Patrol. The Arizona Highway Patrol and CBP work very closely together, especially down by Tucson. So a lot of these Highway Patrols see it as their duty to help Border Patrol. We're going we're to help Border Patrol out in finding people. So uh, she was pulled over for going four miles over the speed limit. Um, Border Patrol was there within five minutes. And she was detained by Border Patrol, never actually given a ticket for speeding or any other traffic violation. And in the old days, she would have gotten to ICE, and ICE would have said, um, go home, because she has no criminal record. She's been in the United States for 22 years. She has four United States citizen children. And she's a single mom. So they would have said, uh, based on, on prosecutorial priorities, we're going to release you. No longer. Now they give every person a notice to appear, regardless of what the circumstances of their detention were. 